a lot of people are looking for compromises and a slightly softer Brexit. I just want to ask, would it be acceptable to you if, as part of this, we decided to leave the single market but stay in the customs union so there didn't have to be a border between the north and south of Ireland and car companies could trade their parts backwards and forwards across the border? I think that would be a very bizarre way of interpreting an open Brexit. Uh, open Brexit, by all means, means maximising our trade links with the rest of the EU, but it also means being able to trade with the rest of the world. Now, even the EFTA countries, Norway and Switzerland and so on, they do it the other way around. They have partial membership of the single market, or in the case of the, the EEA countries, complete membership of it, but they are out, even they are outside the customs union, and so they are able to sign free trade agreements with China, Japan and so on, the, the economies that are really growing. If we're looking to the long term, that's where we need to be. Right. Well, a lot of people have ruled out being in the single market, so the, kind of, the second best for some of those people is being in the customs union. Is that something you could swallow if that's... What, I can see you don't think it's a good idea, you'd rather it wasn't, but could you even swallow that as an idea? But, I mean, I, to be honest, I think some of those people are just sort of grabbing totemically right. at things. Look, the, 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 the referendum was fought by a lot of people who were fairly close to the middle. I've never really bought this idea that the whole country is divided down the middle. Look, leavers and remainers are patriots who want the best outcome. And I think we agree, whether we voted leave or remain, that we want now to have the closest friendship with our European allies. We want to have military alliance with them. We want to have commercial ties with them. We want to keep the bits of the current deal that are working. Uh, and that may include right. some of the existing EU programmes. I don't think anyone's uh, against that in principle. Okay. But we want to do it on the basis of getting the best possible right. deal for no, us. But everybody agrees and that this course, phrase... partly, that means... Getting the best possible deal, everybody agrees with that. And we'd all like all the benefits mm. and none of the costs. But look, I'm taking it that you wouldn't buy the, the, the customs union. Is there any flexibility in your mind about the jurisdiction of the European Court of Justice, the ECJ. Because it may be helpful in the negotiation to say, look, the ECJ, this European Court, can govern our aviation agreements or, for example, could govern the trade in nuclear materials. Is that something that you could tolerate or accept at all? But the, the EU doesn't do that with any other non-EU member state. As right, I say, but could you tolerate it if we could and persuade countries? Them? Could you, could you tolerate but, but why it would that we, came why up? would we go in wanting a worse deal than Switzerland and Norway and Serbia and every other European country? That would be a bizarre position. Um, uh, we want... Look, I mean, the, 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 way you can, the way you can get around that issue and, and make it work uh, to the advantage of both sides is to do what the Swiss have done, which is to say, you'll have your court and we'll have ours, but where uh, there is a, a, a plain interest in having the same policy or a harmonised outcome, we'll simply do that through a bilateral treaty. So we won't be inviting foreign jurisdiction, but the outcome will be the same. The, the Swiss have replicated, I would say, 85 to 90 percent of the contents of the single market, including right. the real biggie, which is the prohibition on discrimination against goods uh, or services on grounds of origin, but they do it through bilateral treaties and domestic legislation. Right. So you're uh, uh, sort of veering towards the Swiss option, but by and large you're not sounding very compromising. Do you think Theresa May, with no parliamentary majority, should, for example, reach out to the other political parties, reach out to Labour and even the Liberal Democrats, and say, look, let's see if we can foster a Brexit that suits 85% of the voters of this country because we got 85% of the voters in the election. Do you think she should do that, or do you think she should only do that if they agree to do it all on her terms? No, I, I do think we should be reaching out. I, I, I've, I've said ever since the vote, it was a 48-52 vote. That is not a mandate for right. severing all your links. That is a mandate for a phased, gradual repatriation of power. We'll end up with a deal that is almost by definition going to go too far for some people and not far enough for others. But we should aim to get a deal that all sides can at least live with. And I think that will mean keeping a lot of the current links that we have with the EU where those are working. But, you know, even what people have been calling the soft Brexit option, which is the, the, the EFTA type option, even that leaves us with our farms back, with our fisheries back, with our international trade, our citizenship, defence, foreign policy. Even, I think we can do better than that, but even that is, is clearly becoming sovereign uh, and having our Mr. own Hammond? jurisdiction. Nobody is seriously suggesting that we, could, uh, we should have e okay. ECJ ruling still telling us what to do when we've left. OK, thank you for, th th thank you for that. Neil Mark Carmichael, let me talk to you. Just out, out you. of interest, which is your favoured option at this point? How, what would you, how would you like Theresa May's Brexit to change? Well, first of all, 
we, we voted to leave the European Union, so what I'm going about, yeah. about to say does not question that. But I do think we need to be much more realistic about the way in which we go forward. And going towards a softer Brexit is clearly uh, an objective of mine and many. Because we need to have proper trade relationships and we need to have those... Do you, do you accept that free movement of people has to go? Because many people have said that is just the starting assumption for all of this is that has to go. Is that, do you buy that? Well, if you take the university sector, for example, that wouldn't be helpful no. for international students or indeed uh, existing members of staff who were from the European Union who are now in, in our country. So that's the sort of thing we have to sort of but have that's a proper yeah, but, but nuance. But free movement is a bit like pregnancy. You have it or you don't. I mean, do you believe in free movement or do you accept it has to go? Well, I accept that the country right. has voted against free movement right. okay. and uh, what we do need to so do... So the Norway though, option is out, basically, isn't it? Because the Norway option has free movement. Um, it has free movement, uh, but I don't think that uh, we need to sort of rule out the Norway option just because of that reason. I think there are other things we can... Consider. Are you hoping that the EU will offer us some other concession on free movement that Absolutely. might allow us something very close to the Norway option? Yeah, I think that's the direction of travel we should be going in because I'm hearing from business increasingly that that's right. an, an uh, the Europeans have given direction. you no basis for thinking that at all, though, have they? Because the only thing they've ever said is, if you want to be in the single market, you have to have free movement. And people like, uh, you know, people have been saying in the last few days, maybe mm. they'll give us an emergency break and the Norway option. Mm. But you're, you would love that, I think. I you? would, but, yeah. but your clip uh, talking about the DUP just before really raised the issue about the border and how uh, the attitude of the DUP might be different to the, the Brexiteers. Can I ask this? Do you think, if you'd been in Parliament, and there are a few like you in the Conservative Party and some who are not as extreme uh, as you on uh, pro-EU as you... I'm well, not usually describing No, 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 think, you know, but, but enthusiastic about the yeah. EU. Would you use parliamentary muscle, because basically you'd almost have a balance of power, did, did, would you use parliamentary muscle to humiliate your own government in order to soften the Brexit? I think what we need to be doing is really what you also asked, uh, Dan, is reaching out to other political parties and reaching out to other stakeholders because we've got to understand that this is not just you know, an objective of hard Brexiteers. This is, a, this is a wider question and it needs to be dealt with in a wider way. I understand that, but would you, but would you vote against you know, important motions of your own government in order to soften the Brexit? You what? voted for Article 50, for example. I did, because I... There'll be equivalent votes, there'll be loads of legislation, great repeal bills and such like, yeah. to get us out of the EU. Would you vote, use your parliamentary muscle, and you'd have more of it if you were in Westminster now, because mm -hmm. there's a very small majority. Uh, yeah, I think, I think that leverage that's now available to uh, colleagues of mine and to the DUP and so on is obviously much higher than, than before. Uh, so, yes, uh, there is a p potential here. But we're not talking about voting against the government, essentially. Not confidence I, motions. No, uh, right. because what we are trying to do here is have a serious discussion about moving the agenda away from purely a hard okay. Brexit towards something more reasonable. Last one. You lost your seat on, on Thursday. Mm. It was a Remainer seat, just, I think it was a sort of... It's considered a seat that was Remainer. Do yeah. you think Theresa May's Brexit lost you that vote? I think that uh, I lost the vote for a number of reasons. Uh, one of them was the manifesto. One of them was actually holding the general election at all. Uh, and one of them was indeed Brexit, because I think that the, the public... Uh, generally, we're looking at the situation and, and, and painting us as basically obsessed with Brexit, obsessed with a hard Brexit. And a lot of people in my constituency certainly didn't want that. So they were not willing to attach their vote to, to my party and therefore, to, and, and therefore to give it to me. And I think that was a real difficulty uh, during the general election for a lot of my colleagues. Neil Carmichael, Daniel Hannan, thank you both very much indeed. Thank you.